Il est passé ah, il est passé ouais. sur la super artiste Super oh, Encore un but sensationnel Hello and welcome to another edition of the Morning Club. This is a special free version of the Morning Club. So for anyone who is not a Patreon supporter of the Handball Hour, uh, we put out a weekly shorter episode reviewing one specific topic usually and whatever is happening in the handball world. So that comes weekly and is exclusive to Patreon members. So if you are interested in getting this bonus content, then sign up for our Patreon at uh, Patreon forward slash handball hour. It's just the equivalent of $3 a month in your local currency plus VAT. So, um, very handy to get access to the bonus content so you have a little taste of it now it's alex kulish here with chris o'reilly how you doing chris good alex good really excited for the the next few days of olympic qualification tournaments yeah it's it really did sneak up on us uh it kind of came out and over this whole uh international break did uh kind of sneak up on us as action in the leagues and the champions league was really getting to to the big spots we got a little break but uh some really good games coming up over the weekend the first of which is going to be on thursday and then uh play all the way through the weekend so there is three groups of four teams um in tournament one which is hosted in granollers in spain we have spain bahrain slovenia and brazil um, a nice group there. Then tournament two hosted in Germany in Hanover is uh, Germany, Algeria, Croatia and Austria. And then tournament number three hosted in Hungary. I'm yep. guessing there. Tatabania. Yes. Yep. <laughs> hosted in Tatabania in Hungary is um, Norway, Portugal, Hungary and Tunisia. So out of the three tournament, which one is... Uh, it's the most interesting for you. I think it's a toss up between number two in, in Germany, number three in Hungary, because you have the the three European teams in them. And uh, I mean that not in any way against the rest of the world. We're all <laughs> always fans of the rest of the world. But like the Olympic qualification tournaments are in a way the most like intense events you can have in such a short sp- period of time because the Olympic Games with only 12 teams that get into it is such a huge thing for in handball for both men and women's teams. They build up to them throughout the, the years. And then in the case of four days here, everything is decided. It's like last chance for teams. And so, you know, you look at today's games, for example, in Hanover, where it's Croatia versus Austria, that's basically a decider on day one for which team <laughs> will join Germany. But maybe Group 3, because it's Norway, Portugal, and Hungary, alongside Tunisia, who are a fantastic team on, on a given day, and three European teams who literally you have no idea what's going to come from them, that could be the most open one. And that that way, that's going to get very sweaty, I think, over the weekend in Hungary. So maybe that one. It's a good one. Again, it's going to be Croatia playing in a tournament with Dagger mm-hmm. Sigurdsson at the helm straight away. That's a... Big pressure situation for yes. <laughs> Sigerson to just step into. Um, uh, so literally his first camp with the squad. Yeah. Yeah. And he's going to be playing um, the, this tournament. We'll have to see if Austria have kind of the same energy that they had in the European Championship, the same momentum and what Algeria can do. But yeah, I agree. In terms of like the, the non-European countries... Uh, there's a little bit of it's it's unlikely that they'll get through you yeah. know you have teams like Algeria and Tunisia well Tunisia are a team who kind of stepped back a little bit in mm-hmm. in quality over the last couple of years Algeria have kind of stepped up again but they're both let's say a level below Bahrain we know are a fantastic team but after their brawl 
in yeah. the Asian Championships, uh, they are missing um, four four players, I think, yeah, including I think so. <clears throat> their talismanic uh, captain, Al Sayed. So again, Bahrain kind of knocked out of there. Brazil, you always want to see qualifying. Let's see if Brian Monte can do um, anything for this Brazil team, kind yeah. of inspired him again. Um, but yeah, ter- tournament number three is just, it's just a wild card. Yeah. Who who wants it more? Norway, Portugal, Hungary, or Tunisia? Uh, yeah, I mean, based on what we saw at the Euro a couple of months ago, you'd have to say Hungary and Portugal are favorites to take those two spots. Two teams qualify from every group uh, for the Olympics. But Norway, you know, they're, they're missing Magnus Rød, they're missing Joran Sugard. You know, they were so bad for them at that European Championship, and then they absolutely smacked Sweden in their last game. Kolstad have had a terrible time since then. Yeah, I, I have a feeling like they won't they won't just like go away quietly. Uh, I think they might upset one of these teams. Like Sandra Sogerson and Torbjorn Bergerud would just like have this amazing game. Tobias Grundahl, now that he, he's been allowed to play for the team, I think they, they'll come up with a win against one of the two of them. And we could have like a three-way tie at the end of that weekend. On paper, I'd say Hungary and and Portugal. But uh, something is telling me that Hungary might just have a tough time at home and miss out, oh, <laughs> which would be dev- which would be devastating. And we're all fans of Hungary now, and we have been. <laughs> but like, they were such a likable team in that championship uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, but yeah, I think a bit like there's always a, a team that you expect to qualify who misses out at this stage. Uh, four years ago. It was uh, Croatia, uh, Spain. Before that, missing out on Rio. I think it could be, could be Hungary this time. Uh, I don't know. Are we just? Are, do, I'm sick of raiding Norway. <laughs> I'm, I'm, yes, you're over it. I'm over it. I'm over it. Yeah. They, they haven't done anything in a long no. time. They're missing some of their best players. Sagasen, while is incredible, just. Uh, it, has somehow just lost the ability to play handball in the second half of the season. And there's... there's n- That's when they get you, Alex. That's when they get... <laughs> everything's suggesting... Everything's suggesting that they're going to do nothing this weekend. And that could be the finally the time they do something again. Uh, whereas Hungary are now expected to qualify, which worries me. That is, that is a classic turn of events. Hungary, mm. uh, with any expectation, mm. um, do struggle. Yeah, and then it's always, um, I think that group one is also interesting in terms of one is looking at Spain because, well, they they need to bounce back after a a terrible European championship. Any sort of failure in this tournament, which, you know, Slovenia did better than Spain in the Euros Mm -hmm. and Brazil have... You know they they have played Spain tightly in in previous games, so it's it's not a complete walkover. And if Spain fail to make an appearance at this championship and and qualify for the Olympics, you know this is this would be huge alarm bells ringing um, for the Spanish squad. You know there was a, bit, a lot of talk about this Spain team during the the Euro about like okay now it's really time for them to. Uh, to start the change and like transition in players uh, because they're just not up to it anymore. And uh, I'm afraid they haven't done that. <laughs> so they, uh, they've really, they've actually, uh, they've actually dug their heels in even deeper. It seems uh, there's a Jody Rivera's 19 uh, man squad. We'll see which of them actually, if they actually play, but Gideon Guardiola uh, mm. is back in the squad. Rodrigo Corrales is probably a good decision to bring him back. But here's one who, you know, four years ago, we thought this was a bit mad. Antonio Garcia is back in the squad. God damn it. <laughs> right? I was reading this. I was like, is this just like a copy and paste from the 2020 uh, 20 games? or what? <laughs> It's, yeah. Uh, it's incredible. 
that worries me uh, a fair bit, to be honest. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's a t- as long as you have the Dushabayevs doing the business, well, they always have a chance. But yeah, maybe uh, Brazil, if they could, they'd be pretty comfortable, I think, in these settings playing in Spain. Uh, a lot of the players have played or do play in Spain. It's uh, it's not it's not going to be. Uh, they've got really nothing to lose as well. And we saw that uh, Brian Monte hit incredible form just like in the last couple of weeks mm-hmm. with Montpellier. Uh, and where did he do that? In Spain against Barca. Spain. So <laughs> everything pointing towards uh, maybe something special in Slovenia. Yeah, they've got uh, they've got Blažjans back in the squad. They were a very, I, they were a positive surprise at the Euro. I think wouldn't count them out at all. Uh, so, yeah, again, maybe another host nation who could be in trouble there in Spain. Let's see. I, I think it's not a walkover, and a failure here could, you know, I, I don't know if it's if it would start talk of uh, a change in coaches, but yeah. you know, it would it wouldn't make things comfortable for Jordi Rivera. Yeah. What what I find remarkable is that Antonio Garcia has just turned 40. I feel like he's been 40 for about 4 years now. <laughs> but yeah. no, he's actually just turned 40 a couple of days ago. So, but still, if you're bringing back uh like 40-year-old goalkeeper, yeah, 40-year-old winger, yeah, but left back, ah, uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe he's just in there like for to steady the ship a little bit. Um but that does worry me slightly. In in that group too, then with Germany, uh, Germany, Algeria in the first game, we feel like Germany will should get off to a good start there. But again, we never know Germany, and then Croatia, Austria, I think that is, that is a headline game for me. Nothing suggests to me that Austria won't come into this with the same good vibes as they did, and they only have to play three games in four days this time. They have a chance, I think, which would be like an amazing rise in the space of a few months from you know, complete outsiders to qualifying for the olympics that would be one of the stories of the season yeah it would and we're talking about this croatia austria game as pure knockout but again germany are not miles ahead of those two teams in um, fact yeah in fact they drew against uh they drew against austria just a few drew couple against of months austria ago yeah. and they also played croatia right they did in the last um and are they did they lose they lost oh, yeah, to Croatia lost, in the last the main Croatia. round game exactly. yeah so in based on that yeah, there are, there might be there you go the Germany are the outsiders <laughs> here based on performance so it's uh, yeah it's it's going to be fun to see how it, it, it shapes out which two teams are going to qualify from each group Alex what are your picks tournament one in Spain I'm gonna gonna go with a heart Spain Brazil even though I oh. think Slovenia will probably make it ahead of spain uh tournament two i have i think germany and croatia will 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 make it um and then tournament three that's where portugal and hungary are gonna make it and norway are not okay that's what yeah i i'll go with i will go with spain and slovenia and brazil just missing out tournament two germany austria and that may be a bit more of a heart choice than a head choice uh Mm. tournament three yeah, to mix it up a little, Norway, Portugal, Tunisia, Tunisia will get a result against Hungary in the first day and just like me- <laughs> mess it up for them. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I'm I'm really excited about it now. It's really open, all three groups in some way or another. I think there's there's going to be some shots. Yeah. And all the games are live on the IHF YouTube channel, unless Good times. of course. Um, it's in you're you're living in one of these home countries so for everyone else you can watch every game um, nice good then uh, before we let you go a uh, quick word on a game we were really looking forward to which happened on sunday uh the top of the bundesliga clash between uh, magdeburg and berlin magdeburg getting the win and basically going top of the table what did you make of it it's just magdeburg being so strong they keep winning these games by two goals. It's just like every tough game that they ha- they've had over the last while in this extremely tough stretch. Yeah, they just win by two goals because they they're almost like a you know an experienced boxer who just 
shadow boxes for the first couple of rounds and then gradually you're not like you're not really f- seeing them getting better and better but their punches are like landing a little bit harder a little <laughs> bit harder and then at the end it's a complete knockout and uh well they won this one by three but uh but yeah i get your point <laughs> you know it's it, <laughs> i think it's it's that slight difference of it's not like a one goal tied yeah. game it's not a demolition it's just consistent comfortable being better than the other team and in this case they just they use their squad really really well and Fuchs of Berlin just didn't have the <clears throat> the team to match up with them just looking at the stats for that really really puts an emphasis on your point there when it comes to the the squad because the top score they had was Omaringi Magnuson with seven but four of those were penalties and then it was a proper spread of like you know Saugster up on the line with six Hornka on the wing with five and then you had uh, Mertens on the other wing with three Klar with four Smarson with two Chris Jansen with two uh, just like everyone getting like chipping in nobody relied on fully to get the job done which is very much the case with uh, Berlin on Sunday where it was Geitzel and Lasse Anderson who really had to carry the team uh, through the game. It's funny because a little bit like the game against Barca a few weeks ago, it felt like even when Berlin you know, had a little bit of control early doors and when they were coming back into the game in the second half, Magdeburg just looked really self-assured and there's no panic on mm-hmm. them at all they just go through the thing uh, go through the motions they know what they want to do and they're they're confident that they'll be able to break down the opponent at some point in the 60 minutes and that is uh that's terrifying i think for the opposition it is and actually uh, omar igni Magnussen had one of the best games i've seen him play for a long time you said he had seven goals but more than half six, of them were six assists as well right yeah, the six yeah. assists is what really impressed me because he kept getting the ball out to the right wing mm. in perfect timing. It was um, it was really devastating uh, and made it look really easy. So Magnussen was just so incredible last year before his injury, and we've seen like gradually seeing glimpses of it. And while his box score, well, actually his box score usually looks better than his performance <laughs> because. There was a game, uh, the previous game against Gummersbach. He had 12 goals, 11 of which were penalties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But but um, I think the assists were really good. And for Fuchs of Berlin, I think they need to learn how to play with a squad again if they have any chance of um, winning things this season. Because they were forced into playing with eight players, essentially, or nine players. They have this whole system of making really good defensive substitutions. Kopliar, Mathis Langhoff coming on in defense. They've been forced into playing with a small squad with, with injuries that they had. And they've developed this style where essentially uh, Matthias Gilsel is a winger in, mm. in defense and does really well because he can actually run out and get those fast break goals. You have defensive substitutions that bring in Kopler and um, Langhoff, and they do a good job of protecting their weaker defenders and enabling them. But now they have a bit of a squad. They have Drux, they have Vida, and in the game against Magdeburg, Vida played about 10 minutes, Yeah, Drux 5. And I don't think that is... That's enough. You know, you, you have to learn how to use the squad. And I think Siever, that's a, the next challenge for Siever to figure out how to actually empower his team by bringing on these um, really experienced good players yeah. but uh, and not being fully reliant on Lars Anderson and Gietzel to score 20 goals. So when they yeah. score 16, they lose the big game. You know, so they, they're going to score you a lot. But yeah. Maybe yeah. not all your goals. Now, I think that's a really good point. And uh, it would it showed a little bit, I think, in that, that clash of styles because uh, Magdeburg always seemed to prepare for individuals very well. And although they were scoring a lot, Geitzel and Anderson, they were also giving the ball away a lot. And their turnovers were being forced. I think it was 10 between the two of them. 
And uh, in that first half in particular, Magdeburg absolutely stormed them on the counter-attack. That was the big difference between the sides. Yeah. And um, the other aspect then was uh, like tearing apart the, the center block. Uh, not necessarily with like uh, brilliant moves, but by forcing them to give away two-minute suspensions. And uh, both the big men were on two two-minute suspensions very early in the match. And uh, you could also hear in the timeouts, they were talking about targeting the players and at one point saying that Marcinic is doing nothing anymore, uh, which is a big statement to make, but it was also true from uh, Bennett Vigard because he, he had two two-minute suspensions. He was scared about getting a third one, so much so that he was brought out and Langhoff was then in as the second uh, center block player. If you have Drux and Vida, both really good defenders, you can use them a lot more if you if yeah. you have them playing both ways. And uh, I'm sure that's something they, well, they can figure out and they'll have to figure out uh, because the uh, yeah the season is uh, maybe taking its toll finally on them just as they get a full squad. So it could be good timing, but they have to figure it out. And uh, it's only a couple of weeks till these teams meet again in the semi-final of the cup in Germany, which is... Uh, which is good fun. And also just a, a last point on Saugstrup, who was monumental in the game. He was just tearing apart Fuchsblin attack. He was shutting down... The steals. Giesel. I know Giesel scored seven goals from eight shots. The steals. But he was... He knew his uh, counterparts, his Danish uh, teammates quite well. Um, and again, they still scored 16 goals between them, but he made it very difficult for them and got that game so really really impressive game by Sextra. brilliant player good stuff that's uh, that'll do it for the morning club uh thank you all for joining and uh, we'll be back next week to look back at what is hopefully a fun and dramatic olympic qualification weekend and also looking back at the first leg of the women's champions league playoffs but until then from alex and myself it's goodbye <laughs>